the series has been primarily focused on taking source code, containerizing it using Docker, and then deploying that on Kubernetes. So if you have been following this series, you'd have noticed that we covered everything, including running web scale applications. For example, the last session, I covered how to run microservices in Kubernetes, where we took a node.js app and scaled it to run as 10 pods, and, and we achieved the maximum scale uh, for that web application. But one thing that's been missing so far is how do we achieve high availability and scale for the stateful workloads like databases? And in our application, we use a Node.js web frontend, which is completely stateless, and a MongoDB backend, which is very stateful. So in the last part of this series, I'm going to connect the dots and, and plug those gaps in the architecture where we're going to now bring high availability to the stateful workloads. So this session is critical to complete the series because it plugs a very important hole that we had in the overall strategy so far, that is running stateful services. So let's get started. In the next 45 minutes to one hour, I'm going to walk through everything that you need to understand how to run stateful services in Kubernetes. So in, in terms of agenda, uh, I, want, I want to do a quick recap of storage in Docker and Kubernetes. Compare and contrast Docker containers persistence with those of Kubernetes. And then I'm going to introduce the taxonomy and the terminology that Kubernetes uses, particularly called persistent volumes, claims, and storage classes. And then we'll take a closer look at a primitive called stateful sets, which has become very popular to run uh, transactional databases and durable workloads on Kubernetes. Finally, I have a very detailed walkthrough of uh, configuring and deploying a MongoDB replica set. So that's the agenda. Let's get started. And like most of my sessions, this is a very demo centric session. Uh, I'll cover enough concepts and then jump straight into a demo where I'll walk you through everything. So let's get started. Volumes. So volumes in Kubernetes are an extension to the pod primitive. So as we have seen, containers are very ephemeral and stateless. And by default, because pods are an encapsulation of containers, they're also ephemeral and stateless. But there are a lot of use cases, a lot of scenarios where you need to bring persistence into pods. Not every workload can be completely stateless and can use uh, the, the concept of a replication controller or a replica set to scale infinitely. There are cases where you need to bring storage, persistence, and durability into applications. And those containers that run those stateful applications, they're also packaged as pods. So how do these pods access the file system and, and get persistence and durability? So that's where we have volumes. So volumes are the fundamental mechanism through which we bring persistence to pods. Kubernetes volumes are very similar to Docker volumes, but they are managed slightly differently. So what are those differences? If you can recall, I think in, in the uh, very first session where I introduced Docker, we dealt with volumes. So when you add a hyphen V switch to Docker run, you are essentially pointing the host file system to the container. So whatever directory or folder you have on the host will become visible within the container. And later on, you can actually uh, delete the container and, and still have the persistence uh, available on the host file system. Later on, when you launch a new container pointing to the same host volume, ho same host directory, you, you get back exactly the same uh, state. So that was Docker containers. Now Kubernetes volumes are very similar to that in a way that you define a volume in the pod declaration and all the containers in the pod have access to that volume. Remember, a pod can have one or more containers. So every container that is packaged into a pod will have access to the underlying volume. And these volumes, like you expect, come from the host. Uh, for example, on a node, when you are running a, a stateful pod, you would actually point the volume to a host directory and that becomes 
visible to all the containers. So in a lot of ways, in a lot of sense, um, Kubernetes volumes are, are like Docker, but they are slightly different as in the life cycle of a volume exposed to a pod differs from that of Docker. So there are two types of uh, volumes, but before I get there, let me help you visualize this. So let's say we have a Kubernetes node and this node obviously has a file system which could be running uh, X4 or X3 or any of the popular Linux file systems. On top of this, we have the pods running. Let's say this pod has two containers, container one and container two, and now we mount a volume into the pod. We expose a volume to the pod. So that obviously comes from the host volume. Same thing when you are running another pod and this is going to have an exclusive volume. So the volume one is available only to pod one and volume two is available only to pod two. And you declare this as a part of the pod definition. Just like we define the ports, we also define the volumes that are available within the uh, host file system. Now, <clears throat> the host based volume can be of two types. One is called empty DIR and the other one is called host path. So when you're defining a volume in a pod, the most simplified mechanism is to use empty DIR. Empty DIR is almost like a scratch disk, which means as soon as the pod gets deleted, the empty DIR volume associated with that pod also vanishes. So uh, it is very good for creating temporary storage area. For example, you have a pod that resizes images and uploads uh, to an object storage endpoint. So you need some scratch disk space where you download a high resolution image, run a thumbnail generator, and then upload the thumbnail to an object storage endpoint. So MTDR is perfect in those use cases where you can access that as a scratch disk and it automatically get cleaned up when the pod is terminated. In scenarios where you need the volume to survive the pod life cycle, then you create what is called as a host path. The host path volume type survives the pod. What, it, uh, what I mean by that is once you create a host path and when, once you persist data inside that, even if the pod is terminated, the data is still retained. It is not evacuated. It is not wiped off or scavenged by the Kubernetes controller after the pod gets terminated. Later on, when you launch a pod and point it to exactly the same host path, you can retain and retrieve the data. So that is the beauty of host path. Obviously, uh, you need to use a concept called node affinity because let's say you launch a pod, you create a host path volume, uh, and later on, when you create a new pod after it gets terminated, it might be launched in a very different node. So how do you ensure that this pod always goes to the node where the host path is created? So you create what is called as node affinity and you always target the pod to the same node. So you can have uh, access to existing data. This is how you can pre-populate large data sets or large directories and then uh, launch a pod on that node so that it can it can access it. It's a very common use case when, when you're running Hadoop or Spark kind of workloads. Then you have uh, the other type of volumes that come from block storage. For example, when you're launching it on DistroOcean, you can map a DistroOcean block storage straight into the pod and that becomes a, a volume. And these are not only independent of the pods, they're also independent of the VMs which are hosting the uh, workload. So even after you terminate the uh, node and, and of course the pod, the data is still retained. So uh, Amazon's EBS, Azure's uh, disk, GCE's persistent disk are other examples where you can actually launch your volumes on block storage and they are very, very durable, very persistent. The other option is to create a distributed file system. For example, you create a, an NFS mount point uh, that is spread across your cluster and you can, you can actually access the data from any pod. And when you are using NFS cluster and start 
typical examples of distributed file system. You don't need to use uh, node definite data that is written on one node will become instantly visible on the other node. So this is one option where you can uh, easily share data across the cluster, but this involves a manual configuration of uh, NFS, Gluster, Ceph, and so on. The more recent innovation in the, in the persistent space is container native. Now, container native is a level above block storage, a level above software storage. This is where the proprietary, very container specific storage drivers that are becoming available. For example, storage OS, Rook. Rook is a part of Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, Portworks, it's a commercial uh, entity that actually delivers highly durable, available, and scalable storage. Dot Mesh is a recent entrant. There are many other container native storage companies that are both open source and commercial. So you could use any of this. The most easiest, uh, the, the most easy one to use the low hanging fruit for persistence is host based. You don't need to do anything. All you got to do is add a volume uh, section in your pod declaration and you instantly gain access to the underlying storage, but it comes with its own limitations. So to avoid those limitations, depending on the use case, you would choose one of these options, one of these volume types. So that's a good backgrounder of volumes. Now, this is a, a visualization of you know, either using block storage or a distributed file system. In this uh, example, we have two Kubernetes nodes, node one and node two. And there is a file system that cuts across both the nodes. It's a distributed file system. Think of it like an NFS or cluster FS. And then we have the same pods that are created. Now, because we are using distributed file system, it can be very transparent to the pods. So when you actually create a mount point that can be exposed into the pod, uh, pretty straightforward. So uh, that is that is one mechanism. It could also be block storage. In block storage, there is no sharing mechanism. For example, um, every every pod or uh, every node would have its dedicated block storage. And this is useful in scenarios where you don't want conflict, you don't want uh, locking mechanism to interfere with your uh, read write operations. So depending on the use case, you would use either block storage or a distributed file system. What you're actually seeing here is more of a distributed file system like NFS that is spanning your entire cluster. All right, so let me take the concept of volume to the next level. So the beauty of Kubernetes is it is very DevOps friendly. Now when I say DevOps friendly, what do I mean? When administrators and operations uh, uh, folks, you know, when they come across a new technology, they are very skeptical. The reason is they don't want to lose control. You know, there are workflows, there are some policies, there are some guidelines that are pre-established within the enterprise IT where every resource, and when I say resource, it could be compute, it could be storage, it could be networking, goes via the central IT. So the central IT would allocate certain resources for each department and every department will further uh, have quotas defined for individual users. So there is a well-defined hierarchy and a governance model. Now, with DevOps, that has become a very convenient way, you know, where a chunk of resources are allocated to every department and department IT takes over and they do uh, rest of the allocation. So everything happens very seamlessly. Fortunately, Kubernetes respects that. So in Kubernetes, the operators and the administrators can basically define quotas. Can, they can define certain allocations and everyone will have to adhere and respect that. So when it comes to compute, uh, it, is, it is pretty straightforward. You can actually define the number of CPU shares in the pod. When it comes to storage, there is a concept of a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim followed by a storage class. The way it works is a persistent volume is a network storage in the cluster pre-provisioned by an administrator. For example, 
in an enterprise scenario, there could be a, a NAS or, or, or a SAN kind of a storage service. Now, the administrator will attach that storage to a Kubernetes cluster and will define persistent volumes for each department. And each department is maybe a namespace in Kubernetes. Now, later on, uh, from the available persistent volumes, which is nothing but a quota pre-provisioned by an administrator, the developer or a user will request uh, a part of that. And that is what is called as a persistent volume claim. So persistent volume is what is available, uh, what is made available by the administrator and a persistent volume claim is what is consumed by the developer or the user. So that is pretty straightforward because uh, you claim a, a part of existing resource and that existing resource is created by your administrator. If those are PVs and PVCs, persistent volumes and persistent volume claims, what is a storage class? Well, a storage class is almost like a driver. It's almost like a profile. For example, organization could be running two different workloads. One is very IO intensive, like HDFS, Hadoop and Spark. Then there are normal web applications. So uh, there are two types of storage backends that are available. One is SSD, one is magnetic, the standard HDD. So when the administrator is creating a persistent volume, he can create two types of storage classes. One storage class could be an SSD based storage class. The other one, is going to be a HDD storage class. So this is going to enable some kind of a tiering structure, uh, even, even in the cloud. You know, For example, uh, when DigitalOcean opens up Kubernetes as a service, very hypothetical scenario, but quite possible. So they might actually give you two types of storage classes. One is standard IOPS, the other one is high IOPS. So how do you consume standard IOPS versus high IOPS? It's going to be available to you as a storage class. So this is uh, basically the interface between uh, the actual physical storage and uh, Kubernetes. So tomorrow, if a new storage provider comes up and he wants to basically expose his storage to Kubernetes, he would actually create a storage class. And that storage class is responsible for interfacing with the actual drivers and the uh, interfaces that talk to the storage backend. So uh, storage class is nothing but a Kubernetes way of talking to a storage driver. Think of it that way. And there could be multiple storage classes um, based on the profiles, you know, based on the IOPS and a variety of other structures. For example, a cloud provider might want to expose uh, platinum, gold and silver, depending on the capacity and the performance. And, and they become storage classes. When you consume one of the storage class, you automatically uh, get the QoS, the quality of service that is defined by that storage class. So, so that is the uh, basic taxonomy that you got to be familiar with. A storage class, which is a type of support, supported storage profile uh, offered by administrators. And this interfaces with the driver responsible to talk to the underlying storage. Persistent volumes are the larger chunks of storage pre-provisioned by an administrator and persistent volume claims are a subset of persistent volumes consumed by developers and users. Now let me put this in perspective. So administrator in an organization or uh, using a cloud uh, platform would register persistent volumes in the pool. For example, there could be a, a, an NFS persistent volume, there could be an iSCSI, there could be uh, you know, GCE or DigitalOcean uh, block storage. So all of those are basically the uh, persistent volumes. Now, once they become available, the developer can create a claim. And, and this claim is nothing but a subset of what is actually available and what is made available by the administrator. So a persistent volume will go through multiple phases uh, throughout its life. It, it is first provision, then it is bound, then it gets used, then it is going through a releasing phase, and then it goes through a reclaimed phase. So that is how uh, storage is basically handled 
by uh, Kubernetes. This is the life cycle of a storage. So um, with, with those concepts, um, I want to now introduce you to stateful sets. So we have looked at the primitives of storage in Kubernetes, you know, just like pods expose compute, volumes and persistent volume claims expose storage. Just like you ask for CPU resources through a pod, you ask for storage through persistent volume claims. Right, so it's, it's simple. An administrator will make a large set of resources available to you and you claim a subset of that. So with that background, how do we build very highly available stateful applications on Kubernetes? Well, um, we need to move a level above the pod or the volume to, to deploy and manage those workloads. Now, just like we, we got introduced to a pod and then we realized there are limitations with the pod and we looked at a replica set, right? So the concept of a replica set brings higher availability and a desired configuration state to pods. For example, when we launched a web pod, we said the minimum count of the pod should be at least two or three. And Kubernetes will ensure that at any given point of time, there are three pods that are running. In between, if a pod gets deleted, Kubernetes automatically brings up uh, another pod to maintain the desired state of configuration. So there is, a, there is an association between pod and a replica set. Well, stateful set is exactly like a replica set, but the association is more with a stateful pod. Because imagine you packaged a pod uh, with MongoDB container, you cannot really scale that because uh, if you scale a MongoDB container, every container will have its own storage and they are never in sync. And there is no replication factor, there is no high availability, and they are constantly struggling to stay in sync. And it is a pain to manage the consistency and the availability of these pods. So replica sets are pretty good for stateless pods, but you need a, a similar primitive, a similar concept for stateful pods, and that's what is a stateful set. So it brings the concept of a replica set to the stateful pod and it enables running pods in a clustered mode. Most of these stateful workloads run in a, uh, in a cluster. For example, there's a master, there is a slave and there are uh, multiple nodes that talk to each other and there is a uh, quorum that gets established and there is a replication factor that gets established and there is a sequence in which they all talk to each other. So stateful sets not only bring high availability, but they also bring in certain abilities for us to run cluster of stateful applications. And this is very, very useful when you're running MySQL master slave or PostgreSQL or MongoDB replica set. Anything that requires high availability can be packaged as a stateful set. So it is extremely valuable for applications with certain uh, attributes, certain requirements like it, it needs to have a stable, unique network identifier. Uh, if you notice, pods have an arbitrary ad hoc name that gets assigned. Uh, whereas in, in stateful set, every pod will get a very unique network identifier, uh, depending on the sequence in which it is created. It typically starts with a zero and go all the way up to N minus one, depending on the cluster size. Uh, it is it is stable and it, it gets persistent storage. Every pod in a stateful set has its own dedicated persistent storage. They are ordered um, with for, for graceful deployment and scaling. So what is create a slave without creating a master? So if you're creating a MySQL cluster as a stateful set, the MySQL master is going to be created first with a, a naming convention of hyphen zero. You know, whatever is the pod name, a zero gets added to it. And that becomes the first uh, pod, stateful pod of the stateful uh, set. And, and that is going to become the master. And then anything that is created after that will automatically get an incremented uh, number, which is typically one, two, and goes on till N minus one. So there is a very predictable, consistent, and certain naming convention uh, that is that is followed for stateful sets. The same thing is applicable 
when uh, you delete a stateful set. So when you delete a stateful set, it starts from the last in first out. So the last one is going to get deleted and then the the first one uh, that was created will be the last one to get deleted. It is before. So uh, this gives you a lot of flexibility to deploy highly available stateful sets. So some of the key concepts you now that you need to understand when it comes to a stateful set is it depends on headless service for port to port communication. So what is a headless service? So we have explored Kubernetes services and we know that Kubernetes service typically can be of three types. One is cluster IP, which is meant for internal communication. The second one is the node port, which is going to be made available on any of the uh, exposed nodes. Then there is a load balancer, which is going to be negotiating with the cloud provider to expose a load balancer. But apart from these three types of services, there is one more service called headless service. And a headless service, unlike others, will never get an IP address. It is just a proxy that passes through the communication. So uh, it is very useful when you want to establish uh, a, a mesh-like network where pods will talk to each other. So when you create a stateful set, you, you will end up creating a headless service and, and that headless service is responsible for the communication between the master and slave uh, or the uh, cluster of pods running as one stateful set. It doesn't require an IP address, so it is not a cluster IP, it is not a node port, it is not a load balancer. It is an IP-less service meant only for intra-communication among the pods. Each pod gets a DNS name that is accessible to other pods in the set. Uh, so it is it is very, very powerful concept where uh, the slave precisely knows what the master's DNS name is. It's not going to change, right? In normal replica sets or any other pod deployments, it's very hard to the name of the uh, pod to the IP address. You never know what kind of a DNS name the pod will, will end up uh, getting. Whereas in stateful set, every pod of the stateful set gets a predictable FQDN that is resolved at runtime. So that means uh, all the members of a cluster can very easily discover and talk to each other. And this, this makes it easy for us to implement uh, master-slave-like deployments. It leverages the concept of persistent volumes and persistent volume claims. So when you're creating a stateful set, you'll say, hey, the volumes are already available and just go ahead and uh, use these claims. So claims are going to be used by stateful sets to establish uh, the communication with the underlying uh, storage. Each pod is suffix suffix with a predictable consistent index, right? For example, in MySQL, uh, it is 0, 1 and 0, 2. Uh, so you know that, you know, this is master, this is slave. And in MongoDB, you may have things like RS1, RS2 and RS3, which uh, uh, denote the replica sets. So pods are always created sequentially and they are deleted in LIFO order. That's what we discussed earlier. So um, with all those concepts, you know, it's time for us to really Take a closer look at stateful set. Uh, again, there is going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial that you can actually repeat. Uh, and I would strongly recommend you to follow those steps if you are interested in learning more about stateful set because nothing like a hands-on lab to get you up to speed. So uh, let me now walk you through the steps involved in deploying MongoDB. So we are basically expanding our to-do application, the Node.js application with a very uh, stateful highly available mongodb backend so um, how do we go ahead and configure this well i'm going to take advantage of three different technologies and platforms here the first one is of course stackpoint cloud that we are now familiar with we are using this to set up a kubernetes cluster on disclosure and of course this entire cluster is running on disclosure we're also going to use what is called as helm so what is helm Helm is basically a package manager for Kubernetes. Uh, if, you, if you have a very complex deployment, for example, your workload could consist of multiple pods, multiple services and multiple volumes. And uh, it, is, it is becoming a very complicated, long YAML file. 
um, and you have to execute them in a specific sequence, it becomes very complex uh, to manage and maintain. Instead, you would wish there is one command that will do all the groundwork, installs you know all the prerequisites, does everything the right way, and then simply exposes the workload, whether as a cluster IP or as the external node port. Well, that wish list is actually addressed by Helm. So Helm is a very powerful open source package manager for Kubernetes that aggregates a lot of Kubernetes primitives into one unit called as chart. So Helm chart is basically an aggregation of a variety of Kubernetes primitives. They could include deployments, they could include replica sets, they could include services, they could include volumes, whatnot. You bring all of them together into one logical deployable unit and that unit is called as a chart. So I'm going to use a Helm chart to uh, run our MongoDB cluster. Um, and, and Helm is actually a client server. So the server component of Helm runs on Kubernetes and it is called Tiller. So Tiller is going to listen on the Kubernetes cluster and you would use a CLI, uh, a Helm command line interface uh, along with Kubernetes kubectl to actually deploy your charts. So what I'm going to do now is to take help of Helm to configure and uh, deploy our MongoDB replica set. So the end goal of this demo is to run our to-do application, the mean application, which is MongoDB Express Node uh, and uh, Angular. So we are going to run that application with a very uh, durable, highly available MongoDB backend and a very scalable web front end. And to show you the power of this, I'm going to knock off one or two nodes uh, just to see how available the cluster is. And we'll actually notice that it comes back immediately. So, so let's go ahead and finish those steps. So it is, it is demo time. Let me walk you through these steps. So first things first, let me show you the setup. If you are uh, not familiar with uh, StackPoint, I strongly recommend you to spend some time uh, tinkering with it. You know, I, I created a, a Kubernetes cluster called Sami Kubernetes, and this is based on the provider disclosure. I already keyed in the API key of disclosure so that this can talk to the disclosure control plane. And what I created is a four node cluster in Bangalore. And uh, this is how it translates into the disclosure resources. So we have four droplets. The first droplet is the master that's running on 8 GB um, of memory, 80 GB of disk. And we have 4 GB, 60 GB configuration for worker nodes. So this is my cluster. Uh, and now what we're going to do is to actually deploy uh, the MongoDB replica set. So let me make sure our kubectl is configured properly. So kubectl get nodes should uh, show us the cluster. There we go. So everything is in uh, ready status. So this is the master and three worker nodes. Perfect. So to help you understand this better, I have uh, uh, a handy script uh, which is, by the way, a part of the tutorial. You can always go back and repeat these steps. So if you don't have Helm installed on your development machine where you're actually deploying MongoDB, uh, you can go ahead and install it with Homebrew. So brew install Kubernetes Helm. One command will get Helm up and running. Uh, I have already done that. So you can verify uh, Helm installation with this command called Helm version. So how did I get Helm? I used the brew uh, installer to get Helm installed on my machine. After that, it, it now talks to Tiller. Tiller is what is running, uh, for example, get pods, namespace is cube system. So this is going to show us a lot of pods running and somewhere you'll notice there is Tiller. So this is Tiller, which is the server side of Helm. So when we actually type Helm version, it is talking to the Tiller backend running on the Kubernetes uh, cube system namespace. So this is the prerequisite. We need Helm because we're going to use uh, a wonderful chart. You know, thanks to the Helm community, they created a, a very powerful chart to deploy MongoDB as a replica set. This saves at least 10 to 12 steps of configuring MongoDB replica set with just 
plain vanilla Kubernetes primitives. All right. Now uh, we also need to make sure that DigitalOcean block storage is available to Kubernetes. How does that work? Well, uh, Stackpoint, you know, the company that created this installer uh, for Kubernetes, has actually written uh, a driver for DigitalOcean block storage. And what does it mean? So the advantage of that driver is any node running on DigitalOcean can actually attach a block storage volume that can be exposed to the Kubernetes uh, environment. So that driver, you know, because I'm using Stackpoint and because I'm using DigitalOcean's native uh, integration, it's automatically installed. If you're not using Stackpoint, then you have to manually install this storage class uh, that Stackpoint has created. But, but thanks to Stackpoint and DigitalOcean's integration, this is already installed. You don't need to do anything. So when you do kubectl get storage class, you notice that uh, the provisioner is DigitalOcean flex volume provisioner. So this is the default one. It's already in place. Now later on, when you actually create a persistent volume claim and say that I need the DigitalOcean storage class type, then what happens is your pod will talk to the storage class and storage class will talk to the driver and the driver precisely knows how to call the DigitalOcean API to provision a new uh, block storage volume attach it to the node and then surface that as the uh, the volume inside your pod. So a lot of magic happens there. And, and again, it's all because of this simple storage class that Stackpoint has written in collaboration with DigitalOcean. It saves a ton of work. Otherwise, this could be a very, very laborious, very lengthy process. Excellent. So now that the storage class is in place, we need to now uh, go ahead and grab the Helm chart. So if you're curious, what is Helm? Well, we can go to helm.sh. So let me spend just a minute uh, walking you through it. So Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes and it, it just makes it so much simpler to bring multiple primitives of Kubernetes into one unit that is called the chart. There are a lot of charts that are available. So for example, when you go to the uh, GitHub repo, you can see a lot of charts uh, and this is going to make it a child's play to deploy complex workloads and as you notice here a chart.yaml file may contain a database services load balancers whatnot so i'm using that so the next step is to go ahead and grab the, the github repo we've already done that so here we'll see there is a directory called charts so within charts, if you go to stable, you'll notice there are a lot of available charts. For example, there is one for Grafana, Hadoop, InfluxDB, Jenkins, Joomla, Kibana, whatnot. Now, our interest is in MongoDB replica set. So this is where uh, we actually have the chart responsible for setting up uh, everything that needs to run MongoDB in high availability. So that's what uh, we do. We basically do a GitHub clone, uh, git clone to, to grab the repo from uh, GitHub. And now we need to do a couple of things to make sure that this chart can talk to DigitalOcean's native block storage. And how do we change that? Well, there is a file called values.yaml and this is extremely flexible. This is where you can modify a lot of things. For example, what port do you want to expose for your chart? How many replicas do you want to create? What is the replica set convention going to look like? What is the minimum available uh, configuration? You can also define you know, the authentication for MongoDB. Uh, where is the image coming from? So values.yaml contains a declarative mechanism of uh, uh, controlling your actual deployment. Eventually what happens is everything that you put here will get translated into a pod or a, or a volume or a, a load balancer, you know, a service. It gets further, uh, uh, get, get, it further gets distributed into one of the primitives uh, that gets deployed in Kubernetes. Now, what I'm going to do here is, you know, there is, Initially, this is commented out, which looks something like this. 
which looks something like this when you actually do a git git clone now what we are going to do is to uncomment this guy right we don't uh, need this underscore and this is where we put distillation and what does this mean well this is the storage class which we have already discovered here so when you do kubectl get storage class you notice distillation is the name of the storage class we are populating it here which means later on when i uh, access a volume when i request for a volume through the claim this chart will negotiate with distillation to grab a, a volume and attach it to the node and expose it further into your pod so it's the it's a simple one liner that makes a huge difference so that's the uh, change that i make nothing else i am i'm going to leave everything the default for example the db path you know the port uh, this is this is these are the entries that go into the mongodb config file we don't need to change anything except that uncomment this line and replace it underscore with distillation that's it so now <coughs> excuse me so now we are all set uh, so what we have done is we got the chart repo and then we have uh, modified the storage class to represent the uh, distillation driver instead of the default one and now we are all set to go ahead and deploy the chart and how do we deploy this chart well let me take you back to the root folder and here you can actually see the helm install command so helm install the name of the chart is called to do because it's it's a database to hold our task list uh, we are now passing the values.yaml that we created in the previous or rather we modified in the previous step so we are giving the path charts stable mongodb replica set values.yaml and then uh, we are also giving the actual chart name stable slash mongodb replica set that is the path uh, of the actual chart that is it now when we hit enter it immediately uh, shows us a few things now these are all instructions on how to access the pod uh, after it is created now let's immediately look at the number of pods right so currently we don't have any pods right uh, or rather one is getting created now let's put this in watch mode now you'll very quickly we'll notice that you know this mongodb replica set 01 is getting initialized and it will become ready meanwhile if we come back to this window now i'm i'm keeping an eye on the droplets volumes you'll notice that i have you know to, to save time i have kind of gone through this process one so that the volumes are already created you don't need to wait till the volumes are created because it is the longest time it takes now immediately this is attached now later on when we actually notice that the second replica set comes up we'll notice that the second volume will get att attached to the droplet so very soon we'll actually have three replica sets that are running and each replica set is associated with uh, a block storage volume and it, it is uh, randomly named with pvc followed by uh, an arbitrary number now how does this happen so the way this works is remember we created uh, we we updated the storage class definition we said every time the chart request volumes use distillation you know that single line is making this difference now very soon we'll notice that the second volume gets attached to the second droplet and, and that is an indication that now the pod is able to use the distillation block storage as a volume. It, it is going to get attached in uh, just a few seconds. So in, in, in about three minutes, we are going to have three MongoDB replica sets, fully configured, highly available, making use of distillation's block storage, right? So this is the best thing about the stack point integration. Now, without stack point, uh, you have to do a lot of manual uh, process. You have to go through a manual process where you need to register the storage class, uh, install the driver, and then uh, basically follow the steps to make sure that you are creating a, 
a persistent volume first and then you're creating a claim because of the storage class we are taking advantage of a concept called dynamic provisioning so dynamic provisioning is even if the uh, persistent volume is not there it is going to quickly ask for an underlying volume and it gets created that is called dynamic provisioning and now uh, we'll actually notice that the second block storage volume is going to get attached to the second node worker 2 will will now have the block storage attached let's give it a uh, few seconds there we go now all the three are actually attached to the block storage and we are almost set you know let, let's wait for all the three pods of the replica uh, set or rather the stateful set uh, show running status and then we will actually verify if the replica set is created and it is up and running this would actually take about 12 to 13 minutes uh, in the normal scenario it is taking just a few minutes like six minutes or so because i have gone through this process and i have created the persistent volumes which are nothing but the distillation block storage volumes beforehand you know that is why it is pretty fast otherwise uh, it has to wait for the volume to get created it has to get attached to the node and then in the um, an average of seven to eight minutes per replica set and we have cut it down to half by uh, uh, running this demo once and repeating it perfect so now we have all the three replica sets of mongodb running now how can we verify if everything is perfect so what i'm going to do is to check this okay kubectl get stateful set this is the name of my stateful set desired count is three current count is three perfect and then we have already seen this you can also notice that there is a headless service remember i i explained you what is a headless service now headless service is actually a cluster ip but with no ip address technically it is it is not a cluster ip because you cannot access it so why is it required well it is required for the three pods of a stateful set to talk to each other they go via this endpoint for communication uh, it cannot be used by anyone else it is exclusively meant for port to port communication that belong to the same stateful set excellent so now what i'm going to do is to execute the mongo client in one of the pods so kubectl exec it the uh, one of the pods in the stateful set followed by the mongo shell right now this is going to drop us right into the mongo shell there we go now i'm going to run this command called rs.conf okay this will actually show us the current configuration of the replica set and this this is very powerful this is an indication that the replica set is perfectly configured now how do we know so in the members collection you will notice that this is the host this is the host it has a pretty long name but this is the unique name of the host and where is it coming from it is actually coming from the headless service which is going to be the dns uh, suffix for this pod so replica set zero is the name followed by the service now the same thing here this is one which means the second uh, pod of the replica set and finally we'll see the third one so that means the configuration is perfect they're able to talk to each other excellent so now the backend is set up right um let's also make sure you know that everything is perfect here so this is the disclosure dashboard and it, it shows that there are three droplets uh, which are representing the three worker nodes of a kubernetes cluster and each of them have a dedicated persistent volume that is being exploited and used by the mongodb replica set perfect now it's time for us to deploy our web app our front end so again this is available uh, on github so this is my application that i've been using uh, within that i have gone ahead and added a new pod which is web replica set that talks to stateful set let me show this in in the editor for better visibility now this is the 
web application front end. It comes with two replicas. Now notice how we have actually wired the connection string. If you are familiar with MongoDB, you, you know that uh, to talk to the MongoDB replica set, you need to provide the names of all the three nodes of the replica set with a comma, separated by a comma. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, so to do MongoDB replica set zero dot to do MongoDB replica set. This is the DNS name of the stateful set pod. And this is what this was what uh, uh, was shown in the rs.conf command, right? So we are not using anything different. It's it's very, very predictable. How could I do this even before I created the pod? That's the beauty of stateful sets. The, the naming convention is extremely predictable and uh, consistent and guaranteed. That I have gone ahead and put this in my YAML file. Uh, this is being passed as the environment variable called db host. And in uh, db.js, you know, which is my mongoose client, what I do is I basically grab this from the environment variable and use that in the connection string. So this is how I'm creating two microservices that talk to each other via the environment variable. So this is my first microservice, which is the MongoDB microservice, uh, sorry, the web microservice. And uh, it is basically using the environment variable called DB host, which is what is being used in our code. Perfect. So uh, this is the final step. Now, let me go to my app directory, Kubernetes, and I'm going to create the web replica set that is now working with our stateful set. The only difference is that environment variable. Uh, if, if I don't use that, it basically assumes you're talking to one instance of MongoDB. So now let's create this. I'll also expose this as a service. So I'm going to create a web service. Perfect. Now let's verify the creation. So get pods. It shows us uh, three pods that belong to the MongoDB replica set, two pods that belong to our web app, and let's get the services. So now we have one headless service for the stateful set pods to talk to each other. And then we have a node port that is available here for the external access. So let's go ahead and test our application. So now what I'm going to do is to grab the IP address of one of the worker nodes. So I'll grab this and get the node port. Okay, so finish the demo, right? So that's my task list. So hello world was created in my previous dry run and, and it is persistent. So it shows up here. Uh, perfect. So now we have the application working. This is the front end. And uh, you know, this, these are the pods. Now let's do something interesting. So I'm going to create two windows. Okay. Let me split them. All right. So now we're actually looking at two windows. Okay. And here I'm going to run watch kubectl get pods. So this is going to run in a watch mode. And here, let's first scale our web app from running two pods to 10 pods. So kubectl scale replica set web replicas as 10. So this is going to now immediately scale our web app. Now, there we go. Now, um, very quickly, we'll notice that you know two pods of web app have become 10. So this is how we scale stateless applications. Perfect. Now, you know, everything is in a, a completely scaled mode. So we can verify, we can refresh, nothing changes, except that the number of pods have multiplied, right? They have gone up from two to 10. Perfect. So let's bring them back. We don't uh, need them. So I'm scaling the application back to two pods. So in, in just a few minutes or seconds, we'll actually have two pods of web running. Uh, you'll notice that you know everything is in terminating mode and very soon they'll vanish. Now, hold your breath. I'm going to now delete my database pods, right? We'll actually knock off one of the replica sets of the MongoDB cluster and see how this actually works. Uh, so scaling in and scaling out web app which is packaged as a replica set 
is not new. We have seen this earlier and that is expected, but how will Kubernetes respond when we actually delete one of the parts of the stateful set? Okay, so this is the desired configuration state. Two instances of web application, three instances of MongoDB running as a replica set. Now what I'm going to do is grab the middle one, right, which is the second node of our replica set and delete it, right? So I'm going to say kubectl delete pod and this replica set. Now this is going to be, be deleted immediately. There we see, you know, it is moving from uh, running to terminating. And as soon as this gets terminated, we'll actually notice that another replica set, there we go, it is gone. So replica set one was gone. And now the another one is immediately initialized with, uh, you know, nine seconds. 12 seconds and, and in, in, in just about a minute or so, we'll have this node in running mode. And while this is happening, does anything change to our application? Nothing. It's absolutely the same because it's running in high availability mode. Uh, our application doesn't even know that one of the nodes of MongoDB cluster have been knocked off. It doesn't even know, it just functions like the way um, you know, it is expected to work. So that's the beauty of a stateful set. Extending the ability of scaling in, scaling out and desired state configuration uh, from replica sets to stateful sets. That is the beauty of Kubernetes stateful sets. So this basically concludes, um, you know, everything that we promised all the way from what is Docker to running a highly available application with both web tier and the data tier uh, running in HA mode with desired state configuration. Uh, and and if, you, if you actually go back and replay the webinars and repeat some of these steps, you will actually go from zero to 60 in a couple of hours because we covered everything that you need to get started with containers and go live uh, running the highly available production workloads. All right, so let me take you back to the slides. So uh, quite a bit, you know, I started off with volumes. I spoke to you about how volumes are used along with pods. Then we looked at storage class, persistent volumes and vo volume claims, PVs and PVCs. Uh, then I extended the concept to a stateful set and showed you how to deploy stateful set with Helm charts. Uh, and, and then we use the stateful set to maintain a highly available cluster. So that brings us uh, to the end of this webinar and also this series. Uh, I hope you found this useful.